What's going on everybody? If you're new to this channel, my name is Quentin Stuckey, otherwise known as Stux. I make videos to do with narrative, personal development, psychology, philosophy, among so many other topics. If you're new to this channel, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe. We finally made it to the final episode of Story Structures, and that means that we're on the seventh of the seven basic plots originally outlined by Christopher Booker and then popularized in the article by Gavin McMahon. Gavin's article has been extremely helpful to me. He designed these diagrams based off of, again, the work of uh, Christopher Booker, and so I'm really thankful to Gavin. Big shout out to Gavin, and there'll be a link below in the description box. And in talking today about Voyage and Return, we're going to be utilizing a work by a black female writer. Some of you might be familiar with this book, others may not, but we're going to be looking today at Quicksand by Nella Larson. This is a book I actually first read in an American literature class back in my second year of university studying English at Ryerson. And I remember reading it and really, really liking it, so much so that I ended up writing my essay on it. I thought that in some ways it was almost as if Larson was writing kind of a catching the rye type of book because this book is about alienation, but it's not about alienation on a general level, it's about racial alienation and the Lee character being the offspring of a black father and a white mother. And so this character, Helga Crane, is trying to find her place in the world as someone with mixed race. She's not completely black and she's not completely white. And I think that we often forget how difficult it is for people, not just in their identities, but certainly when your identity is, uh, is hybrid. I mean, everyone's identity to an extent is a hybrid identity, but when you don't, as I said, completely fit in with whites and you don't completely fit in with blacks, where where is that gray area? And so Helga Crane struggles throughout the book to find that gray area. So I immediately thought that it was almost like a, a, a black female version of Catcher in the Rye, not so much for the voice necessarily, but the sense of uh, angst and alienation that Helga Crane feels throughout the novel. And I liked it so much that I wanted to use it as one of the examples in my video series and it does fit in pretty neatly with the voyage and return plot structure there's a lot of traveling in this book in fact the majority of the book is really just Helga Crane traveling from city to city from country to country trying to formulate an identity that's outside of her racial identity voyage and return is another one of those plot structures that I think is instantly recognizable to people and really easy to understand one of the most classic examples would be the Wizard of Oz, the sixth book in the, oh, no, sorry, not the sixth book, but the fifth book in the Chronicles of Narnia series, Voyage of the Dawn Treader. It is a plot structure that's used time and time again, and it's often meshed together with the quest narrative. In fact, there's a lot of confusion about the difference between the quest and then the difference between Voyage and Return. I think the main difference is that Voyage and Return actually features a pretty long voyage. Almost all of the story is going to be about this voyage. Whereas the quest is about the attainment of some object, not so much the journey itself. But Voyage and Return is really about the journey to oneself. Setting off into the unknown and having these experiences and then coming back to yourself. And maybe the characters change, maybe the character hasn't changed, but nonetheless, the majority of the story is focused on that voyage and the changes that the character experiences as a result of that voyage. And we can see that in our everyday lives. Today, for example, I took a very long walk to go and sell some books. And um, since I'm trying to uh, save money right now and avoid the COVID-19 virus, I'm not really utilizing transit unless I absolutely have to. So I walked 50 minutes there and then 50 minutes back, five zero, not 15. And by the time I got back, because that's a solid, you know, 100 minutes of uh, walking, I was just exhausted and I was sweating and I was hot. And that, and I, I'd gone on this long voyage and then I returned to my comfortable apartment and I, felt changed from the experience. At least I felt accomplished. So I felt different after the journey as opposed to before the journey. So there's an, a real life example of Voyage and Return. So let's get into it. Let's analyze Nella Larson's quicksand from the perspective of the Voyage and Return plot structure. The first point in the Voyage and Return plot structure entails the travel to another distorted world. 
So Helga Crane is introduced to us in the novel, and right off the bat we are told that she is of mixed race. In fact, Larson goes into great details about her appearance. She describes her hair, she describes her particular skin tone, she describes her lips. She goes into great detail to make it clear that Helga Crane is not 100% black and also not 100% white. As I said before, she had a black father and a white mother, and the black father ended up leaving her mother, and so Nello was primarily raised by a stepfather. Helga is currently in Naxos, which is a southern town, and obviously in the southern states there is great racial tension even to this day. I mean, there's great racial tension in, in the states. Obviously, we've seen that over the last couple of months. But Helga is teaching in this town, and she begins to grow dissatisfied with her life. She feels as if she can't truly connect with anyone in the town. She feels as if that a lot of the staff members there, specifically the white staff members there, talk about how they're not racist and how progressive Naxos is, but then Helga sees all these contradictions that claim otherwise. I mean, one example in the book is that uh, black women are not allowed to have their hair a certain way because the the headmaster feels that it doesn't suit the black women, it doesn't suit their skin tone. So right off the bat, you know, there's there's still this kind of oppressed and oppressor narrative going on at the school, no matter how progressive they claim to be. Helga has a lot of ties to this place. Not only is she teaching at the school there, but she's also supposed to be marrying someone there. And she decides to let this all go. She decides to get out and go somewhere because she feels so dissatisfied with herself, so dissatisfied with her environment that she decides to leave. And so, as I said, the majority of the novel is Helga traveling from city to city and then later on outside of the country. She first travels to Chicago where she is shunned by her Uncle Peter's wife and she's not allowed into the house. The aunt wants nothing to do with her. So from there, uh, she ends up traveling to New York and she becomes a secretary to a black woman by the name of Anne Gray, and Anne Gray is someone that is quite vocal about the the race problem, and she is a obviously a black rights activist, which of course isn't a far fetch because uh, during this time that that Larson wrote this book, there was the Harlem Renaissance. And for people that aren't aware of what the Harlem Renaissance is, the Harlem Renaissance was essentially a artistic, intellectual, philosophical, political movement that emphasized the work of black artists, black writers, black musicians, black politicians, black intellectuals. It's one of my favorite things that I've ever learned about in my program. I think that the Harlem Renaissance is a really fascinating period in just the history of the world and in black history, especially. She then goes from New York to Denmark. She keeps traveling all over the place because everywhere she goes there's this sense of dissatisfaction with her environment, with the people she's encountering, and no matter where she goes she can't help but be uh, categorized into this racial binary category. People can't help but remark upon her skin tone because obviously she's a little bit lighter being from a mixed race background and people can't help but comment on that. So obviously she gets really fed up with that. The second point in the Voyage and Return plot structure is the protagonist feeling threatened, trapped, and overwhelmed. She spends all this time traveling between cities and eventually between countries when she goes to Denmark, and in Denmark she's prized and groomed as an exotic being, again because of her mixed race ancestry, and she is painted by this uh, painter named Axel Olsen, who ends up actually proposing to her, but she turns it down because she just doesn't want to marry him for the simple reason that she just does not want to marry him and all the friends around her in Denmark think that this is rather peculiar and why wouldn't she want to marry Axel and so from there she goes back to New York and when she gets back to New York she starts to feel that all of her traveling has been a waste of time she feels that no matter where she goes she just encounters racism even amongst people that are trying to eradicate the race problem in the United States she can't help but be surrounded by it everywhere she goes. When she goes back to New York, she ends up wandering the streets very distraught, and she runs into a church, and, and in particular a preacher named Dr. Pleasant Green, and the two of them actually end up getting married. The third point in the Voyage and Return plot structure is the sudden return with a new perspective on life. So as I said, she returns to New York and she marries the preacher, uh, Reverend Pleasant Green. 
and the two of them actually go back to live in the southern states. So she's not specifically back in Naxos, but she is back in the southern area of the United States, which is where she was before. So she did a complete voyage from Naxos to Chicago to New York to Denmark, and then back to the southern states. So she doesn't explicitly return to her first community, but she returns to the area where she was originally residing. And what's interesting about, about this story is that she returns and she does have a new perspective on her life, but it's not a positive perspective. She feels lost. She feels confused. She doesn't know what she wants. She doesn't know where she fits into society. She feels pulled in all these different directions and, and she starts to wonder, well, is the problem me or is it society? And that is an issue that Helga just can't resolve. Helga's experiences have taught her that no matter what environment she's in, the fact that she is half black, half white, places her at a disadvantage because people can't easily categorize her. But nevertheless, they still categorize her as different, obviously because she is different. And her experiences have uh, woken her up to this reality of the fact that, well, maybe it's not completely me, it's also society. That's why I'm having a hard time integrating. And I think that we can still see that nowadays with people that, again, have identities that don't fit into the norms of society. And I think that this book can be extended upon anyone who's felt this struggle to fit into a category that society deems socially acceptable. The final point in the Voyage and Return plot structure is the initial circumstances improving. But I can't say that Helga's circumstances have really improved. This is where the book makes a detour from the Voyage and Return plot structure. Helga ends up having four different children with the Reverend Pleasant Green, and at the end, Helga is still dissatisfied. She doesn't know what to do. She thinks about leaving her husband. She thinks about going someplace else. And the book ends with the birth of her fifth child, which directly implies that Helga is now trapped in this situation because she's not only married, but now she has these kids to look after. And, you know, it's implied that Helga didn't find any peace in spite of all the traveling that she did. She didn't find any peace within her identity. And again, that says a lot about not just back then during the 1920s, but certainly today of, of being considered a problem because you don't fit in with the dominant society's agenda. And certainly minority groups experience that every day. So this is a story that really resonates uh, with everything that's been going on over the last couple of months with the Black Lives Matter movement. But I think that it also resonates with uh, the fear of difference that is so pervading in our society. It's so present, you know, there's, there's always going to be that fear of difference, but that doesn't mean that you can't tolerate difference. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be progressive and work to change our biases and change our attitudes. So I think that this book is really important for today. And I think that it will remain important for decades to come. And I certainly hope that 10 years from now, we look back and, and see how much things have changed and how great they've become. But of course, you know, in the meantime, we have plenty of work to do. So that's all the time that we have for today. Thank you for tuning into Story Structures. I hope that you enjoyed this series. If you're new to this channel, please like this video and hit the subscribe button. And the Patreon link is linked below. Any money that you donate to me helps me to bring on higher profile guests. It allows me to do deeper research in the projects I want to explore. It allows me to purchase better video equipment. It also helps me a little bit because I am a student with student debt. So any amount at all helps me out. $5 a month, $10 a month, $1,000 a month, anything at all. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.